Let's uh, stand today, and we're going to read the Word of God first. That's the first thing we're going to do, and so let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians in the Scripture, 2 Thessalonians. As you're turning, we welcome everyone, whether you're online, thank you so much for being with us, or whether you're here in person, we welcome everyone, and we are overjoyed to be able to have you participate with us. So we're going to read this, and no, it's not the wrong passage. Uh, let's read it. You say, well, that's the one you did last week. It is. Let's read it again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Ready? Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Father, add your blessing to the preaching of your word this morning, and help me not add anything unnecessary, and help me, Lord, to uh, include everything that you want said. It's an unusual day, Lord, and I pray that you would help us to focus in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, by now, you're saying, well, look, that's where you preached last week. Are you forgetting yourself, and you're, you're going to go back and preach the same thing over again? Well, I heard about an old preacher one time that it was his first Sunday in the pulpit, and the pulpit committee had brought him in as an excellent preacher, and when he got up, he preached uh, from John chapter 3, you must be born again. Then on Sunday night, they had a service. He came back and he preached, you must be born again. They had a midweek service, usually a prayer meeting, but he stood up and preached. Guess what he preached? You must be born again. So the chairman of the search committee cornered him and said, hey, that was great. Good sermon. We do hope that you have more sermons. And by the way, why do you keep preaching the same sermon? And his answer was, because you must be born again. And so uh, that's a kind of an interesting, interesting story. But this morning, I know I'm going back to the same passage and I'm doing it on purpose, but I trust that you will soon recognize this is not the same sermon, but it's because of the sermon and the passage that I read last week. Last week I talked to you about, about urgent care and the urgency of the gospel message, the urgency that we have as believers to hear, understand, and communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think about Noah's ministry in his days leading up to the flood as a comparison to our call by God to our kingdom duty today in, in spreading the gospel. Uh, Noah had to build a boat, and he had thousands of critters to accommodate on that boat, and it took a whole lot of work. But there was an overwhelming message that was given both by mouth, that is what he said, and by action, that is what he does, did regarding that boat. The very building of that enormous boat, the very building of it was a warning. It is not always going to be like this. They had enjoyed the set of circumstances that they had always had. They had enjoyed them up to that point. But Noah's building of the boat and the preaching of 120 years while he was building it basically was saying that trouble was coming, and that would be making an, an understatement of, of colossal measure to say that trouble was on the way because soon the flood would come and take everyone away. And listen to these words, only those who were on the ark were going to be delivered and safe, only the ones who were on the ark. Now today... We as believers are busy doing lots of things, and that is only right and it is required. We're being fathers and husbands, and we're being wives and mothers, and we're being students. We're being all the things, workers. We have many, many irons in the fire, so to speak, and we need to be doing all of these things. But the truth is there's a kingdom reality that we must keep in mind that will maintain our focus and will concentrate our efforts as part of Christ's church, which is God's rescue organization to the world. And it's so important for us to understand this. God does not have a plan B, C, or D. God's plan for mission and God's plan for rescue to the people of the planet 
concerning their souls is the church of Jesus Christ. This is why we exist. It is so very important. You see, every person on the planet is headed to an appointment with death. Most by natural causes, others by accident, some by criminal, criminal activity, and then others will actually face what we have been preaching about in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, the day of the Lord, which, when, in which the world as it is will be no more. Now listen to 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, talk about this. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some people count slackness, that is, He's not lazy or indifferent, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when it says long-suffering, it's just simply speaking about the incredible patience of God. Aren't you glad God is patient? Aren't you glad that we don't step up to humanity and say, please be patient with me? <laughs> because humans are not patient with each other. But God is patient. He's been patient 2,000 years since the resurrection of Jesus. We live in a time of great patience, a time of, of great grace. We live in what is called, I believe, the church age. But nevertheless, verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And folks, whether we die of old age, a heart attack, a terrorist attack, or the day of the Lord, the stark reality is, is that every human has an appointment with death. Everyone. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed to men. And somebody would say, the women, yeah, I'm glad the old man's going to die. No, it's appointed to mankind, people, all of us. It's appointed to humanity once to die and after this the judgment. And so the grave truth is, is everyone outside of the ark in Noah's day perished. There were only eight people who survived the flood of Noah's day. Eight. And the rest perished totally, completely, didn't survive. And everyone on the outside of Jesus, the true ark of safety will likewise perish we have a message for the nations. We have a message for our friends. We have a message for everyone. It's a message of glorious hope. It's a message of rescue. It is the message of the good news. And it's urgent that they hear it. Jesus said this. He said, whoever will may come. But he didn't ever say, but whoever won't will still come. We live in a day of evangelicalism in which many are saying that it really doesn't matter what you believe now because God is so great and God is so good that at the end of the day His grace covers all and everyone sooner or later will be in heaven with God. That's not what Jesus said. He said something completely different. So this, there is tremendous urgency concerning the need for the gospel message to be shared we must run with the Word. And that's the name of what I'm talking about is running with the Word today from chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This time, this week, um, I sent out in the GAP prayer sheet, which somebody would say, what is that? Well, God's Army for Prayer is a sheet that I send out. It'll come in your email box. Uh, we send it out and... Um, uh, it is a short devotional with some very specific prayers, not just about, you know, Aunt Matilda's big sore toe, but about, you know, about let's get it, about reaching people with the gospel and what we're doing here at the church and how we're to be serving the Lord. If you'd like one of those, you can get on your app and send us a message or send us an email or something. We'll put it on there for you. By the way, it's going to start showing up on the app and on the website. There's uh, 220 or so, so families that already receive it. But in this prayer sheet, I referred to Philip the Evangelist of Acts chapter 8, how he received the call of God to leave what he was doing. And he was doing something very significant in Samaria. He was seeing many people come to faith in Jesus. But he was called to go to a desert called Gaza. And uh, he was to evangelize someone there. And when he got there, uh, there was an official of Candace, who was the queen of the Ethiopians, sitting in a stopped chariot in a caravan and there was a man sitting on the chariot reading a scroll and now Philip had left Samaria made the trip down there to this place and when he this place in Gaza and when he got there God said to him 
go and join yourself to the chariot and to the man that's sitting on the chariot. And I love this phrase. It says he ran to the chariot. He ran to the man. I love that. That's just so, I mean, it just shows the urgency that Philip showed even himself there. You know, we just read in, in what Paul had to say in 2 Thessalonians 3.1. He said, we're supposed to run with the word. And here we have an example of a, of a deacon, actually, who became an evangelist who ran to the man. And he ran to obey the Holy Spirit's command. The man was reading Isaiah 53, 7 and 8, talking about Jesus. And he asked him this question, do you understand what you're reading? That is, Philip asked the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading? And the man gave this incredible question to him. He said, how can I accept some man guide me? How can I without someone to explain this to me? And folks, I just, I can't emphasize this point enough today. In every person's life, if they ever come to faith in Jesus, there are always three, three irreplaceable elements involved in a person's salvation experience. Number one, the Word of God. Number two, the Spirit of God. Number three, the messenger of God. Nobody gets saved without those three things. You say, well, I, what if somebody just reads a gospel track? That was a messenger involved in the formation, the printing, and the placing. What about Gideon Bibles? There was a messenger. There, was somebody, there is always, 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 until we get to Revelation chapter 4 when there's an angel flying through the, uh, chapter 14, an angel flying preaching the everlasting gospel up until that time, only through the mouth of people is the gospel message ever going to be explained to other people? How can I unless some man guide me? Oh, how important this is. Philip began right there and taught him the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And the man received Jesus and was baptized. He didn't wait six weeks, six months, or six years. He said, look, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? <laughs> and he got baptized right there. He said, if you believe with all your heart, you can. And he did. Awesome. Folks, we need to run with the Word, the good news, and we all need to do it. We all need to obey the great mandate, and we need to do it at all costs. I could go all over the Bible today to reinforce the thought, but let me just read one little section from Romans 10. How then shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone to tell them? Oh, it is so incredibly important. What I'm going to do today might shock you. It might be completely different than anything you've seen me or any other pastor do. I'm going to treat you as if this was a seminar on how to lead a fellow person to Jesus. I'm going to talk about that today. And I am going to act as if the entire listening crowd needs to be evangelized, both those that are online and those that are here in person. And so I would implore you your rapt attention. If you're a believer and you say, boy, I'd love to share my faith, but I just really wouldn't know where to start, how, and so, oh, please listen. There was a sheet out there you could pick up with all of this written down on it. Also, it's on your app. You can look at it and see it under the sermon section. This is so helpful, and I believe it will be helpful. But also, I have two reasons for doing this. I want to be able to say that I have given you a simple plan to use as you seek to help, help others come to faith in Christ. I don't want it to be said by anyone that comes here who knows Jesus, well, I would share my faith, but I don't know how. And then second, I want to help people who are listening online, or maybe you're here in person. I would like to tell you that you personally can have a relationship with Jesus. You can be saved today from your sin. You can get your eternity settled before you leave the room, before you turn off your set. This is very important. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray once again that you would give Give us the attention of everyone. I pray, Father, that we would focus very clearly on what I share over the next few minutes. And God, I pray that we would, we would take advantage of this. For those that are believers, let it be a seminar, a how-to of sharing your faith. And for those who are new and they want to understand, I pray that you would help me as I share the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to borrow from Bill Fay a few questions that he uses in his Sharing Jesus Without Fear presentation. And they're wonderful. They're not anything new or earth shaking. He just put them in a good order. And the first thing he does when he shares with anybody is he says, Do you have any spiritual beliefs? You know, people are spiritual today. You know, they may not be churchy, 
but they're spiritual. I mean, there's all kind of spirituality. There's all the isms, you know, the Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on. But then there's other spirituality. In fact, uh, I found this one. There's a, there's a religion called Pastafarianism. And what is Pastafarianism? Well, they worship, they worship the, uh, this is the church of the flying spaghetti monster. You think I'm kidding, Google it. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing. I mean, there's, people are spiritual. People have spirituality. The, uh, uh, there, there are churches of agnostics and churches of atheists that get together for the fellowship element, and they, they don't believe in a God or anything other than themselves. People are spiritual. So we asked somebody, what are their spiritual beliefs? She said, well, what if they say something you don't know anything about it? Ignore it and just keep going. <laughs> you ask this question. You say, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus just that Sunday school person, you know, that they talked about all the time? Is he the guy with the little lamb sitting in a field? You know, he's just sitting there and he's just very, you know, very gentle. Is he a martyr? Is he just a great moral teacher? Who is Jesus to you? Or is he, is he somebody more? And then you might ask, uh, do you think, and this is huge, do you think that there's a place called heaven, and do you think that there's a place called hell? I've been doing this for many, many years. Wildly more people believe in heaven than believe in hell. Why? Because they, they can think of an idea of, I deserve to go somewhere a little better, but they can't think of the idea of, I need to go somewhere that's a whole lot worse. They, they can't picture that. I would say 80% or more of the people I've ever talked to personally believe that there's a heaven. And then a far, far fewer percentage of people believe that there's a hell. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier. Many people think that the grace of God abarks everyone. And therefore, at the end of the day, quote, unquote, love wins and his grace wins. No matter how evil or bad you've been in your life, eventually God's just going to save you because he made you and you're going to be able to come to heaven. And then, uh, this is the big one. People really get nervous about this one. And maybe even as a believer, you well, I just don't want to ask this question. Well, I recommend it anyway. That is this. If you were to drop dead, where would you go? I'll just say that right here this morning. If you were to drop dead in the next 10 minutes, where would you go? So, well, that's a very uncomfortable question. Intended to be an uncomfortable question. If you drop dead, you see, death is a reality. Death is not just a possibility. Death is not just a probability. Death is an actual fact. Oh, it is so important. If we were to drop dead, where would we go? And if somebody says heaven, then the question is why? Why do you believe that you will go to heaven? Well, of course, you know. I mean, I live in the United States of America. This is a Christian nation. I mean, I'm, I'm not a Buddhist because I wasn't born in, you know, in, in India or, in, or in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And I'm not a Hindu. I wasn't born in India. I wasn't born in Saudi Arabia. So I'm not an Islamic. I was born in the United States. So by default... You know, I must be a Christian. Or maybe mom and dad were Christians. Or maybe you were like me. You were born to Christian parents. And by the time you were two weeks old, you were already in the church nursery. (laughs) I didn't think I would ever get out of the nursery. But just, but but, I mean, that's just the way it is. I've always gone to church. Therefore, God's going to accept me. Or maybe I give money. Or maybe I'm, maybe I followed the steps. They told me to get confirmed. And I did it. And I just did all these things, you know. And I'm okay. Or maybe it's on the other side. I hadn't done too much bad. I think God's going to let me into heaven because I haven't killed anybody, robbed anybody, didn't rob a bank or steal anything. I'm a pretty good guy. Nobody's perfect, but you don't expect me to be perfect, do you? And I can't be perfect. And so we think like that. I just hadn't done too many things bad. Well, the following question is, if what you believe is not true, would you want to know? Well, there's, there's some people out there don't want to know it. Nope, I'm satisfied with what I got. I'll just stop right there. Well, you're done. You really can't lead anybody further. But if a person says, well, yeah, I'll be sure to look at it. Because what you want to do is read some Bible to them because the Word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And it reveals the intents of people's heart, you see. And so we're supposed to do that. We, We need to get to the Scripture. And so if a person, I'm talking to you today, and so you're kind of like a captive audience, you know, unless you want to embarrass yourself and jump up and say, I don't want to hear this guy, I'm leaving. You're you're listening, so I'm just going to go ahead as if you want to hear this. And if you're a believer, I want to help you. If you have yet to come to faith in Christ, I want to help you. Pastor, what do I need to know in order to know that I'm going to heaven? Well, we need to know what God expects. 
So turn to Exodus chapter 20, if you would, in your Bible. You say, what? We're going to go to the Old Testament? Yes. Exodus chapter 20. Now, I tell you to go to Exodus chapter 20, and many of you know what's there. Come on, let me raise your hand if you know what's there before I even get there. Yeah, you do. It's called the Ten Commandments. And here's what they say. You can go there, and I'm just going to highlight them. Uh, verse 3 says, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4 says, you shall not make for yourself any kind of image, graven or otherwise. 3 says, you shall not. Verse 7 says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't be a hypocrite about it. Don't say you know Jesus and live otherwise. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Give God his time. Don't rob God of his time. Uh, and then verse 12, honor your father and your mother. That's self-explanatory. You shall not murder. Any questions? Um, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery, much broader than just marital unfaithfulness, all kinds of sexual things. You shall not steal, self-explanatory. You shall not bear false witness or lie, that is. And you shall not covet. That means to envy, be jealous of, and wish you had what somebody else had when it doesn't belong to you or wishing they didn't have it. Covetous, covetousness. So we read through that list, and I mean, it kind of, how do you feel about that? Anybody measure up? Well, let's just look at number one. Look at number one. No other gods before me. In essence, it means there can be, if we have any love, loyalty, or desire that comes before God, then it breaks the first commandment. It's more than that. Anytime I choose my own way, over God's way, then for the time that I've chosen it and the disobedience that I've shown, I've said like Adam and Eve, I know what you want and what you have said, but I don't want that. I want my way. Then for that moment, I'm God, of my, I'm my own God, and I've put God second. That's what Adam and Eve did. You see, God demands perfect obedience to His law, and to break any particular element of His law is an infraction. And so, to add to the list of things that people will say, well, look, I'm going to be fine because I keep the Ten Commandments, and I'm sort of snarky, and I'll say, oh, yeah, well, could you list those out for me? We don't know them. It's hard to keep a rule you can't talk about. Do you think there's anybody on the planet that has kept the first commandment in totality, understanding that to put myself and my will before God is to break? Is there anybody that's kept law, rule number one? Anybody? No. God demands perfect obedience, and to break His law and to break any particular law is an infraction of the whole law. And so that leads me to get you to take your Bible and go to the New Testament, to Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10. Romans 3 and verse number 10. I'm going to move through this rather quickly. And what we want to understand, first of all, is the fact of sin, Romans 3.10. And I'm going to encourage you to just write in your Bible alongside. If you have your actual Bible with you today or if you want to highlight on some kind of mechanical way, you could do that or some kind of technical way, you could do that. But in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, sort of summing up all of those Old Testament declarations, it says, as it is written, many times, especially in the Psalms, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In other words, on the positive side, nobody has anything right that they can offer to God. I'm righteous. I do a lot of right things. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not any. It's pretty straightforward. Second, you could write beside Romans 3.10 in a pen there in your margin. Romans 3.23 will just read that. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there's nobody righteous. Nobody has anything positive to offer God. And on the negative side, everybody has sinned and everybody falls short. So I ask you, what does that mean to you? If you're out there in online land, what does it mean to you to hear God say, everyone is a sinner. Well, there's not a single person that is righteous, that is right in all that he or she does. That all have sinned, which means to transgress, to step across the line, to go too far, to commit an infraction. And that we have fallen short of God's glory as demonstrated by Jesus who was sinless. If you want to know how what is required, Jesus lived a perfect life and he set the mark right here. Is there anybody that measures up on planet earth to this mark? Is there anyone? 
No. Let's say it another way. We have fallen short of His glory. We have missed the mark. If I were to bring in a target for a bow and arrow and set it up on the platform and stand you at the back and say, shoot with an arrow, it would be a strange thing, even if it was a compound bow, for you to be able to hit the center. Well, the Bible says nobody has hit the center. But forget about standing in the back of the room. It's as if the thing was sitting on the platform and you were standing on Pluto. The question is, do we understand that we're sinners. So I just ask everybody in the room, everybody online, do you agree with God? Do you think it's true that we're all sinners, that I'm a sinner? Can you say that you're a sinner? How many of you are sinners today? The fact of sin. Sin, that which is in contradiction of God's character and His will. Then something else. Not only is there the fact of sin, there's the penalty of sin. Now, alongside verse 23 in your Bible, write down Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And here's what it says. Just as through one man, speaking of Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. Thus, death spread to all men, for all have sinned. So there's the fact of sin, and then there's the penalty of sin. Right beside Romans 5.12, write this little reference, write Romans 6.23a. And it says there in 6.23, down at the bottom of the same page, it says, uh, Romans 6.23 says this. It says, for the wages of sin is death. 5.12 says, Adam sinned, and he passed it on to everybody, and everybody sins. And then chapter 6, verse 23 says, and the penalty, the wage. We understand that word wage. What does wage mean? Well, you know, we're wage earners. We work here or there, and either weekly, bi-monthly, or at the end of the month, you get some kind of remuneration for the efforts that you have put forth. It's a wage. Well, God's giving out wages for what we have earned. With our efforts in life, with our work and our deeds and what we do, we have earned the wages of sin and its death. So let me ask you a question as we go through. What do you understand from these verses? You read the verse. Can you agree with God that I am a sinner? I inherited it from Adam, and because of that, I'm, in, I'm headed for death, and that the wages of sin is death. So what do you understand? Here's what I understand, Phil Winfield. I understand that I have earned the death penalty for my sin. Somebody said, well, everybody's going to die. It's got to happen some way or another. No, it's not just death as we think of it. This is the separation factor. Death is separation. It's more than separation from physical life. It is mainly separation from the physical and spiritual presence on earth and in eternity from God's presence, His protection, and His provision. Separated from God for eternity in a conscious existence. And so if sinners have earned the death penalty, and death means to be separated from God, to not go to heaven, what does that mean about you? Now, this isn't the end of the story, but for everybody in the room, point one, the fact of sin, we are sinners. Point two, the penalty and wage for sin is death, which is separation from God forever. I'll go ahead and say the terrible word, in hell. Then where does it leave everyone? It leaves us in peril, in trouble. So whether you're a believer today with friends, neighbors, loved ones, and work companions who are in that situation, or whether you yourself have never called Jesus to be your Savior, called on Him, it leaves you in peril. It leaves you in danger. And so I have to ask, what does it mean about you? Then the third thing is is there's the fact of our sin, the penalty of our sin, and then there's the fact of God's love. Return now to chapter 6 and verse 23. Chapter 6 and verse number 23 says this. We read it already. The wages of sin is death. I pointed out in the first service, I'm really glad there's a comma and not a period after that. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. There is the fact of God's love 
He is offering us a gift in the person of Christ, and the gift is defined. It is eternal life. So you've got eternal death on the one hand, and you have eternal life on the other hand. And then next, I'd like you to just put beside Romans 6.23, write down Romans 5.6. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 6. It says, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And that's kind of another way of talking about people who are sinners and dead in their sins. We are not godly. We are ungodly. Verse number 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now let me just step into this personally and tell you this verse captured my heart. Romans 5, 8 captured my soul. Because here's what it says. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Imagine for a moment your worst moment or the worst series of events. Maybe not what you actually did, but in your heart what you wanted to do. The Bible says God has it all recorded. It's all written down. He knows everything. And imagine that this morning we could just project it up on that screen. I'm talking about those moments in your life. I'm talking about that that issue, that sin, that series of events. And we could project it up there. How many of you would not want anybody to see what's been in your mind, in your heart, or maybe in your actions? How many of you would not? Well, God saw it. Jesus saw it. And he said, I see that. I see everything Philip Winfield did. I see what his thoughts were, his heart's desires. I understand the wickedness of that little boy. I understand that man. And I love him anyway. And I will take all of that sin. And I will take it on myself. And I'll take his place. You see, God proved his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us because God's not limited by time. He's seen all of humanity and all of our sin and all of it. All of it, Isaiah chapter 53, all of our sin was put on Jesus and he he died for you and me and for all the things we might have seen up there. Aren't you glad Jesus died for you? Oh, it's incredible. It's the fact of his love. What do you understand from these verses? Well, God loved me in spite of my sin and my disobedience. What do you understand? Well, he has a free gift for me. Not death that I deserve, but eternal life that I don't deserve. That the gift of eternal life is from God and it comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus died for me knowing all about all of my sins, past, present, and future. And he died for me. So I asked you the question this morning online and in person, if the sin that separates you from God can be forgiven, do you want to be forgiven? And then there's this issue finally of the receiving of a gift. The receiving of a gift. I'll read the verses and right there alongside of the verse you had in Romans 5, 8, write this reference, Romans 10 and verse number 9, and we'll go over there and we'll read just a couple of verses there. In Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and so looking at this whole point he calls this a gift so there's the fact of sin the penalty for sin the fact of God's love so what must you do to receive the gift of salvation according to these verses what must you do well I confess I am a sinner I am a sinner. I I have sinned. I inherited sin. I practice sin. I prefer sin. I'm helpless before the temptation to sin. I'm a sinner. I confess. And I believe that Jesus died and that he rose again to take away my sin. And that the verse 13 says, call out to Jesus to save you. Let's summarize. I ask you, are you watching online or with me in person? Do you believe that you are a sinner? Do you believe it? 
Do you agree with God's word? Do you believe that the penalty or wage for sin is separation from God forever? Do you believe it? And then do you understand that God loves you anyway, and he sent his son Jesus to die for your sin? And then do you understand that you must receive salvation as a gift by receiving Jesus as your Savior? Come here, Michael Nelson, if you would. I need you to help me with something. Just stand right there. Now, Michael, I've got a card here. Let's just say this is a get-out-of-jail-free card, okay? And I've got this card here, and I want to give it to you, but I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to put it right here in this book, and I'm going to tell you I want to give you the get-out-of-jail-free card, but to receive it, you're going to have to receive this book right here. So in order to receive it, what do you got to do? You have to receive it. You got to take it, believing that I meant to give it to you. Exactly. And inside of there, there's this get out of jail free card, right? And so you got this book and you got the, now let me, can I have it back? I'm, God's not an Indian giver, but I am. Okay. I'll take that back. So <laughs> you can be, so you can sit down. So let me show you something. The gift of God is eternal life, but it is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal life is not a commodity that you get on a shelf. Eternal life is not something that you can get separate from Jesus Christ because the Bible says that to know the one true God and His Son who He sent is eternal life. So to receive Jesus, to receive eternal life and forgiveness of sins, you get it when you receive Jesus. Believe, receive, call on Him, ask Him to save you, and He'll do it. You say, Pastor Phil, is that how you talk to people? Hundreds of times, if not thousands of times, I've just sat across from somebody and said, listen, there's the fact of our sin. There's a penalty for sin. God loves us in spite of our sin. Jesus died for your sin. Will you let him in? Will you call on Jesus? Are you a believer today and you know Jesus as your personal Savior? I just walked through a way, not the only way. I can take you many other ways, to, but a way to present the only way, which is Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus to be your Savior. Maybe you never called out to Him. Maybe you're online and you're thinking, well, I thought it was church and I thought it was baptism and I thought it was this. No, it's none of those things. It's calling on the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you like to do that? Would you like to be forgiven of your sins? Would you like to receive this incredible love that looks beyond your sin and says, I love you anyway. I'll pay for your sin and I'll receive you to myself. Will you receive me? Do you want Jesus? Bow your head and close your eyes and let me share. If you understand the fact of your sin, that you're a sinner, that you're separated from God now and will be in eternity, if you believe, if you confess your sin and believe that Jesus has died for you and will call out on him, he will save you. Say something like this to God. God, I know you're there because you're talking to me right now. My sin is real, and I confess it. And I know that in many ways I fall short of your glory, and I walk way beyond what your plan is for me. I'm a sinner. I understand what I deserve, but I'm asking for what I don't deserve, and that's forgiveness. I deserve to be separated from you. But today I believe Father God, that you sent Jesus, your son, to die for me, and he did die, and that he was placed in a tomb, and on the third day he rose again. I believe this, and I believe that he is inviting me to receive him, and so I do. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I trust you now with my past, present, and future and I ask you to be my Savior. Save me from my sin. I put it all into your hands. Thank you for dying for me. Today, I believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you might be in the room this morning and you did that. If so, let us know. Go on the app and tell us. Or come right up to me and tell me. 
very quickly, I want to just read a few verses to you very quickly. Jot down the references. They're on the sheet. If you don't have the sheet, jot them down. What is it that's happened here? John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But there's another group of people. He who does not believe in the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Everybody divides into two groups. Those who believe in the Son, those who do not believe in the Son, those who believe in the Son, everlasting life, those who don't believe, everlasting condemnation. You can write beside that verse, John 5, 24. I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and will not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. It's as if we walked across a bridge. I was on the side of death and damnation, but I walked across the bridge of the cross to salvation, and now I'm over here. And then the final verse, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. It's not in the church. It's not in the baptistry. It's not by the sacraments. It's not by keeping rules. It's not by giving to the poor. I could go on for the rest of the day. It, this life is in His Son. You either have the Son of God by faith in your heart and life, or you do not. He who has the Son of God has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Wow. Two groups of people, those who have the Son and those who don't. Have you received Him? then you have the Son if you have. You have eternal life. And folks, we can know it. Went up to see your dad, Jeanette, yesterday. and <laughs> Such a joy to talk to somebody. He says, well, come what may, I know that I know that I know that Jesus is my Savior and I know what eternity has for him. Father, add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word. Equip your saints for the work of the ministry. This has been a mini-seminar on how to share our faith. And at the same time, it's been a gospel presentation for those who need to come to faith in Jesus. I pray that you would draw people to yourself. If they haven't already prayed a prayer of faith, I pray that you would give us opportunity to talk to them today. In Jesus' name, amen.